Good morning. Welcome to The Last Vampire. Evil Thirst. <clears throat> Many hands shoot up. Oh no. Let's... We're past this. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, what happened here? Oh, wow. Why did this happen? All right. Okay, something. I have a feeling. Okay, here we are. The time is well after one, but I do not drive straight home. Being a vampire, I find one in the morning not unpleasant. Also, since my rebirth as a vampire, I have found I need a little rest, an hour's nap here and there. Even when the sun is high in the daylight sky, my powers are hardly affected. Once again, I attribute this to the fact that I used primarily Yaksha's blood to bring about my transformation, and a few drops of polished child's blood. I, like Seymour, have the influence of it in my life. I drive to Joshua's Tree National Monument, and when I drive, when I arrive, the moon is high in the sky, the park is large, and I have no idea where Paula sat when that when the brilliant blue light came out of the sky and blessed her. Only that she sat on a bluff watching the sunset. After the blue light left and the sun rose the next morning, the surrounding Joshua trees were larger. The Joshua trees around me, they were all taller. Are you sure? Pretty sure. Some were twice the size they had been the evening before. I park in a spot that catches my eye and get out and walk across the desert. The moonlight as it pours over me seems to seep into the crown of my head, and I am reminded of the time in the desert outside Las Vegas, when I escaped the nuclear explosion by filling my body with moonlight and floating high into the sky. As I prowl the sandy terrain among the Joshua trees that stand like sentinels from another age, I feel my, I feel my step lighten. It is almost as if I can bob off the ground, and that possibility fills me with excitement. To fly up with the stars and escape the prison of my problems. My bare arms begin to glow with a milky white radiance. I can almost see through them. Then I see the place. My recognition of it is immediate. I do not even have to take note of the tall surrounding trees to confirm my belief. I simply know it is the spot. A feeling of tranquility, of sanctity, even even radiates from the place. It draws me forward. Clearly something momentous occurred here. In a minute I am standing atop the bluff where I am convinced Paula conceived her child. I lift my arms to the stars. Suzama, I call. Show me what you saw. There is no answer, at least no obvious one. Yet I am suddenly overcome by a wave of fatigue and I sit down, sit down to close my eyes and meditate with the rhythm of the breath and the secret mantra. Soon, white light is pouring not from above, but from place inside me, and I'm lost in memories of the nights of wonder and terror at the feet of the tender clairvoyant who saw not only the birth of God, but the death as well. 
There was, of course, a reason Suzama died so young, and perhaps I was part of that reason. When I arrived... Okay, now we're going back in time to a memory. Because she knew Suzama. And she was a friend. When I arrived in Egypt, it was 50 years after the death of Lord Krishna. 50 years into the Dark Age. What was to become known as Kali Yuga. Following the trail of adventurous merchants who traveled the Far East thousands of years before Marco Polo was born. I arrived in an Egypt that to my eyes was infinite in splendor and riches. Truthfully, it overwhelmed me, although I was also relieved to be out of India, where Yaksha was in the midst of a bloody rampage to destroy every living vampire as part of a vow he made to Krishna. The bright sun was hard on a young vampire like me. Riding into the enchanted city on the back of a camel, I had to keep my head covered <clears throat> with many layers of cloth. The sun burned into my brain, sapping every ounce of my strength. Yet the sight of the Great Pyramid, four times larger than present-day pyramid that bears the same name, filled me with wonder. Covered with shiny white ivory and capped with glistening gold, it stole my breath away, all I could think, as the bright rays heated my already boiling blood, was to escape into dark interior, rest, and try to forget the many trials of my journey. I thought it more than coincidence that one of the first people I met when I entered the magical city was Suzama herself. She was far from a high priestess that day, only sixteen, with long dark hair and eyes as bright as they were kind. <coughs> she, she wore a slave's simple garment. I saw her bending over the bank of the Nile to collect water in a large clay j jar. On my exhausted camel moving slowly toward her, I thought she seemed to stiffen. She glanced over her shoulder at me, almost as if she felt my approach. Later, she was to tell me that she already had many visions of my coming. As our eyes met, my heart beat faster. I could remember no dream I'd had about her, but I knew her face was one I would never forget, awake or asleep. Suzama was not merely beautiful. Although, she would have been considered attractive in my age or place. Her allure came from the marks that, that austerity and pain had stamped on her young beauty. Marks that made her enchanting, not repulsive. It was as if she had witnessed a thousand lives of suffering and came to a realization that transcended mortal acceptance. She was both sanity and sensual. Her lips were generous. She had only to smile to make you feel kissed. I loved her when I saw her, and until then I had never loved anyone on sight except for Krishna himself. She offered me a drink from her jug. I am called Suzama, she said. Who are you? Sita. I answered, giving her my real name. I drank the water hungrily and splashed some on my dusty face. The Nile was cool and sweet in those days. I don't know what has become of it now. I am now here. But Susanna shook her head. You have always been here. Then she touched her heart and saw tears in her eyes. I know you, Sita. You have great power. This was the first sign of her power. Suzama knew things from inside herself, not from outside. Indeed, later, I came to believe that the entire world was a dream to her. Yet, paradoxically, it could still cause her intense pain. 
Her deepest, her deepest feelings were enig enigmatic, dispassionately unattached, but at the same time passionately involved. When she took my hand and led me in the direction of her family, I felt I had been touched by an angel. Yet I did not know that for the next three and a half years, I would hardly ever leave her sight. Her mystical mission had not yet begun, but soon it would hit like a lightning bolt, and I would be her thunder. Oh my goodness. Now we're starting chapter 5. Then next morning I have been only seconds in my expensive and exquisitely furnished tri-level home in Pacific Palisades when the phone rings. Upstairs I hear Seymour snoring peacefully. Yet the call makes me anxious. Our number is unlisted. Who would know to call so early in the morning? I pick up the phone and hold it close. Hello? There's a pause, then a soft voice, a gentle inflection. It is I, she says. The, the blood f freezes in my veins. Kalika. Yes, mother, you remember me. That is good. How have you been? Fine, how are you? Wonderful. Busy? You haven't found him yet, I say. You're not going to find him. Kalika could be smiling. You are wrong. I haven't found him, but I'm going to find him. You are going to help me. I hardly think so. You think too much. Your thoughts are blind. Your thoughts blind you. I told you, I'm not going to harm the child. I'm your daughter. You should believe me. I believe you even when I hear you're lying to me. Where are you, I ask? Not far. I'm high up. I have a view. You would enjoy it. How did you get this number? It wasn't difficult, I paused. I saw you last night at that boring meeting. I saw you talking to those people. If possible, my blood grows colder. Just by meeting and talking to people, I put them suddenly in danger. It does not seem fair, fair that I should love someone who causes me such grief. Yes, I am chilled by Kalika's call and grateful for it as well. How hopeless mothers are. Those people are no concern of yours, I say harshly. I think the doctor's a nice man, but I see you like the son. It's a devil, isn't he? A pause. Is it appropriate for a daughter to comment on the company her mother keeps? No. She laughs softly. Nothing is, it, is as it seems. Black, black. Well, I'm see. Uh, black can appear white when the light is blinding, but white loses all luster at the faintest sign of darkness. Why trust them when you can trust me? Because you are a cold blood murderer. Yes, she is. Oh, we all have our faults. When did you become so judgmental? My tone is bitter. You know when, I suppose. How is Seymour? He's dead. That was his corpse at the lecture last night. I sigh. He's fine. No thanks to you. I see I can be merciful. I am a mother as well, you know. You called Paula. You faked my voice, and even so, she did not call you back. That is true, Kalika says, but Susanna would know how to set up a meeting with Paula. She might have spelled that out in her book. You knew her, didn't you? I hesitate, yes. And you st still think fondly of her. But to this day, you do not know what destroyed her. She was destroyed in the big earthquake along with the Cetians. Her death is no mystery to me. But who were those Cetians? You stared them straight in the eye and did not recognize them. I I knew they were evil in the end, she mocks me, but too late to save Su Suzama. Why do you talk about them, or are you just up to your old tricks? The master manipulator trying to confuse the issue. If you want to come for me, fine, come now. I tire of your games. You don't scare me. <clears throat> 
Now, Cetians. That is something interesting. Kalika is a long time answering. While I wait for her next words, I listen closely and hear in the background. Not far from where Kalika is, the splash of water. My daughter must be near an open window, standing on a back balcony perhaps. There is definitely a swimming pool in her vicinity. It is far below her, I believe. There are many people in it, children playing with a ball, laughing and shouting, and more serious athletes swimming serious laps. I hear the latter turn in the water as they finish each lap and push off the walls. I count the strokes, and there are many of them. It is a large pool. There are not many such large pools in the Los Angeles area. I should be able to get a list of them. Kalika finally speaks. I do not want to harm you, mother. I am here for the child. But, but if you stand in my way, I cannot promise you that you or your darling Seymour will survive, she adds. That is not a threat, merely an observation. Thank you. I feel much better. Why did you call? To hear your voice. For some reason, your voice carries special meaning to me. I don't believe that, I say. It is true. And the other reason for your call? If I tell you that, that it will spoil all the fun. A pause. Is there anything I can do for you, Mother? Leave Dr. Cedar and his people alone. Leave the child alone. Kalika hesitates. I'm afraid I can't do that. Is there anything else you want? I slump up against the wall, exhausted. You know, Kalika, the night you were born was hard for me. The delivery was agonizing, and I lost a lot of blood. I almost died, and even when I held you in my arms and looked into your eyes, I was scared. Even then, I knew you were not normal, not even by vampire standards. But despite all that, a part of me was happy, happier than I had ever been in my life. I didn't realize this until later. I had wanted a daughter, and now I had one. God gave you to me. I thought, and I thanked him for you. I have to take a breath. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. You are what you are. Your nature is to kill, and I understand that because I'm a killer as well. But over the century, I have learned to control that instinct. Now I only kill when it is necessary. You can learn to do the same. I pause. That is what I ask of you. Only that. She considers. When she speaks next, her voice is particularly soft. It is almost as if she is speaking inside my brain. And I find her words strangely moving. I can do that for you, mother. But my list of who can live and who must die is vastly different from yours. The phantom... Ray was one of your illusions, one of your mayas. Your desire to have your child Lalita reborn is still a maya for you. You, f you refuse to let it go. That is why you were given me as your daughter. One of the reasons. But anyone who sees through the veil of ma maya cannot fathom the divine will. The veil is stained, and the absolute is without flaw. One cannot reveal the other. In the same way, I am your own daughter, but you cannot fathom me. I have to shake myself to resist her subtle spell. My memory reminds me that she is using me. Was torturing Eric to death part of God's will, I ask? She speaks matter-of-factly. I did what I did to Eric to inspire you to tell me the location of the child. A pause. Besides, he was not well. He was going to die anyway. His, his next birth will be more auspicious. I snort. Of course, he was not well. You had been drinking his blood night and day. He died in horrible pain in your hands. 
So he did. And he stained my dress. She laughs again. Goodbye, mother. Don't think about what I told you. It will only confuse you more. Just have faith in your darling daughter. It is the only thing now that can serve you from suffering much greater pain. Kalika hangs up the phone. Oh, now we're on chapter six. What is going to happen? All right. As Seymour comes down for his breakfast, I am sitting at the kitchen table. I have made him bacon and eggs and toast, his favorite high cholesterol meal. He has on a brown robe and is fresh from warm sh from a warm shower. He smiles at me as I pour his hand-squeezed orange juice from the other side of the table. One day you're going to make somebody a great wife, he says. Thank you. One day you're going to make a girl have a nervous breakdown. You worry about me too much. I just went to the movies. God knows where you were. He picks up his fork and tests his eggs. Did you get me the morning paper? You know, can't enjoy my food unless I am fully informed on current events, he jokes. I speak seriously. I am your morning paper. He butters his toast. What's the matter? Did Susanna predict that I am the next Messiah? The scripture is authentic. You saw it? A piece of it. Susama wrote it. He puts down his butter knife. But how come you never saw her working on it? I was with her most of the time, but not every second. She could have written it on a number of days. But she didn't talk to you about it. And you were her best friend. She never talked about it to me, but Suzama kept her own counsel. I doubt if she spoke to anyone about the scripture, but she left it in a place where it could be found at a time she wished it to be found. Seymour considers. How did you talk to Dr. Cedar into letting you see him? There's an edge in his question. Are you asking if I slept with his son? I noticed you were talking to him after you told me to get lost. I didn't tell you to get lost. I told you to go have fun. I paused. I convinced both son and father that I, am, I have a similar scripture. They want to see it soon. Great. We can make one up this afternoon. We can make papyrus and age it in the sun. Then you can give me a lesson in drawing hieroglyphics. He paused. It wasn't a very inventive lie. It served its purpose, I frowned. I will have to give them something substantial to make them let me see the remainder of the scripture. Why don't you just give them me, them me to use as a human sacrifice? Stop that. They are not, they are not such a bad bunch. Then I have to smile. But they are busy practicing with auto automatic weapons in the desert. They sound like a nice all-American cult. No, I don't think they're that. But they really do have guns. I heard the Cedars talk about them when they didn't think I was listening. I pause. But those guns might come in handy. Why? Kalika called. This shocks him. When? Half an hour ago. Did she call here? Yes. He lost his appetite for his breakfast and sits staring out the window, his face pale. In the distance is the, is the blue Pacific. Only he and I know how red the water can run when it is diluted with blood. Yet I remind myself that Seymour does remember exactly... Oh my God! Only he and I know. Uh, uh, only he and I know. Red, red. The water can run when it is diluted with blood. Yet I remind myself that Seymour doesn't remember exactly what Kalika did to him. The time has come. I know to tell him many things. How did he? She get? 
our number, he muttered. Who knows? She gets what she wants. If she has our number, she has our address. She could be on her, her way here now. Okay. I have to stop, unfortunately. I have to go to work. So now, for those of you who are interested, and tomorrow, oh, my brain is all over the place, isn't it? Tomorrow we will continue reading Christopher Pike's The Last Vampire. All right. Now, for those of you interested, I am the YA horror author of Vampire Juice. It's a horror mystery adventure that is character driven and fast paced with vampires and teen romance. Now, here is the question of the day. What is a parent's worst fear? What do you think about that? A black car slews around the corner and speeds toward us. We stumble onto the grass. The long car screeches to a halt next to a curb. A man hops out of the hearse. It is the clerk who kicked us out of the store. We sprint down the street, sneakers smashing against the pavement. The tall man grabs me into a bear hug. I kick and scream. The lurky clerk will not let me go. He holds me tight. Where is the vampire juice, he bellows. I pause before continuing to yell as loud as I can, shouting for my life. You do know, he hisses. He drags me to the back of the hearse and throws me into the coffin. You will tell me one way or another. He slams the lid shut. Hey. <clears throat> if that's something you're interested in, Vampire Juice, my link is in the bio. Thanks for watching, and I will see you tomorrow.